We come to the last session in this series, and I entitled it Practical Prayer for Spiritual Warfare. Now, over the years, I've done a lot of preaching and teaching on spiritual warfare. Uh, this is a reality that the vast majority of Catholics are oblivious to, but which nonetheless uh, is real, very real. I'm getting too old, and so are you, to fool around. I don't have time for Catholics who say, well, I don't believe in this or that, when it's a definitive teaching of the church. This reality is real indeed. The enemy is real indeed. The consequences of this battle are real indeed. There is a battle, a war, between good and evil. And it's been going on ever since the fall of the angels, which is a doctrine of the faith. In the beginning, God created everything out of nothing. That's what creation is. God doesn't require pre-existent matter to make something. Um, he's God. He's the creator. And he can create things out of nothing. And that's what he did. And the angels were part of that creation. The existence and the activity of the angels, both good and bad, is a doctrine of the faith. I've had any number of pseudo-sophisticated, pseudo-educated persons flippantly say, oh, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in angels. I don't believe in the devil. I don't believe in purgatory. I don't believe in hell. And I, I always say to them, why would you brag about that which makes you a heretic? <laughs> if you proclaim uh, to be Catholic and you say you don't believe in this or that teaching of the church, don't boast about it. That's a serious problem. That's what separates you from Christ. And they say, oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. Technically speaking, when you do that, you excommunicate yourself. Why? Because the automatic and immediate penalty of heresy is excommunication. So why would anybody in their right mind want to do that? The devil is real. The fallen angels are real. The good angels also are real. Purgatory is real. Hell is real. These are all doctrines of the faith. You need to learn your faith. I know you're good people, and I know you know your faith to some degree. But like I've said before, I can prove to you, if I had the time, I could prove to you that you don't know it as well as you think you do. Well, how do you, well, how can you prove something like that? Oh, it's easy. Easy, you know? If with the crisis in education, if they, they'd say, well, how, how can you know if the kids know what they should know? You test them. It's the only way. At every level. Every level, they should be required to know a certain body of knowledge. In, in arithmetic, in English, and so forth. In religion, it's the same. It's no different. You know, we should know certain things. And it's not hard. This is easy. Really, it is. We, we, can, we can fly spacecraft to the moon. And, and you think you can't learn a little basic religion? Sure you can. Sure you can. Everybody can. And it's very, very important to do that. St. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, said, Ephesians 6, verse 10 and following, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, fallen angels. 
against the rulers of this present age of darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in regions above. That is the real war. It's a spiritual war. You know, this war that we see in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, the, the, the threat of terrorism all around the world, those things we see, obviously. Those things pop up here, there, and everywhere. Um, some of you are, are old enough to have lived through World War II, you know, like my mom and dad. Hitler and all the horrors that he represented. Uh, there are still people, there were people back then, by the way, who said, well, all we have to do is talk to the man. Yeah, right. You know, it'll be okay. Well, let's, let's just ignore that. Let him do what he wants. We don't want to, you know, and, and the, um, the thinking, you know, some of the radical pacifist thinking. Listen, it is good to be a person of peace. You want to be a peacemaker. Absolutely. Jesus is the prince of peace. So you got to want peace. Only a crazy person wants war. My grandmother used to say, now my grandma lived through World War I, which my grandfather fought in. She lived through World War II, which her son went through. She, she lived through Korea. She lived through Vietnam, which was my era. Uh, and then she passed away before the Gulf Wars. And she always said, war is hell. Now that was a simple statement from a simple woman. And, you know, it was a common statement. Many people made it. War is hell. Indeed it is. War is right out of hell. No question about it. And you can't be pro-war. But, but, there are times throughout the course of history when evil men arise driven by, inspired by, the evil that is unseen. All the evil that you see on the face of the earth is merely an external manifestation of that evil which is unseen, the war between the forces of good and evil. We are involved in that war. Whether you like it or not, believe it or not, know it or not, we are active players in this combat, this immortal combat. You need to know something about it. You need to be prepared for it. Soldiers have weapons. Soldiers have tactics. Soldiers have to know the nature of the enemy. I am absolutely appalled, and I mean appalled to the point of sadness and of anger at the lack of understanding of these basic things in the Catholic Church. I don't blame the people. I don't blame the people. I blame us. The people have not been taught. The average priest knows nothing of these things. Nothing. They're not taught in the seminary about this reality of spiritual warfare. They're given no practical education in this. None. I didn't get it, and I went to a good seminary. I got it on my own. You know, as they say in the, in the Army, you know, OJT, on-the-job training. God showed it to me. The Holy Spirit instructed me. Some good priests instructed me. This is a daily reality, combat. One of the books I'll be working on in the next year. You know, I, by the way, uh, I say this frequently, but I, I know information is it, it sometimes not clearly conveyed for whatever reason. Uh, I'm not retiring. I'm, uh, if, I don't know if any of you heard that. I'm not retiring. Um, I'm not retiring. 
I'm taking a year off from traveling. I've been traveling nonstop for 16 years. I'm taking a year, uh, staying home. We have a state-of-the-art television studio now in my new offices. I'm staying home to produce some television series, radio programming. Um, our website is going to be reconfigured, updated, made better for you. And, and I will be working hard. Uh, not traveling for a year. I imagine some at some point we'll travel some again, never as much as we used to. I used to do, for years, we did 40 events a year. And uh, that, the, I, I marvel that we could have done that. I, today, I, could, I physically couldn't do it. Uh, it takes me three or four days to recover from a, an event like this. I don't, uh, I get, um, I'm not tired when I do it. I don't get tired. I don't, last time I slept was Wednesday night. And that's normally the way it is. I'll sleep again tomorrow night, you know, go home, pick up my dogs from the boarding kennel, take them home, and sleep. But I haven't slept since Wednesday night, and I never do when I travel. I rest some, but I don't. I, and when I get home, though, it hits all at once. So eh, I'm not so old, but I'm older than I used to be. A lady said to me, Father, you're not old. You're middle-aged. I said, honey, I'm middle-aged if I live to be 120. <laughs> you know, that's, I'm not middle-aged anymore. But, but I'm also not in the tomb. So, you know, I, 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 we can still put out a lot of work. I'll tell you, with technology today, we can fight this war like we never fought it before. Oh, we can. We have television, thanks to Mother Angelica, you know, more than anybody, really. She's done more than anyone. She knew it. She, she saw it in a spiritual way, uh, really, uh, years ago. She saw it in a mystical way, the battle between the angels, the good and the bad. And it takes place in the air. And she, she realized, too, she had an intuition, a spiritual, I think intellectual vision, you could call it, uh, that the airwaves were powerful. And you have to use this. And so this, this area of spiritual combat, we're all involved in, in spiritual warfare. But in, in a special way, we've got to be more, more systematic about it. We've got to be more prepared for it. Uh, from the day I began my ministry, from before I began, before I went to the seminary, I knew what I would do. You don't really know until your superiors in the church confirm it. My superior, I met him my first month in the seminary. He didn't know me, I didn't know him. We sat down and, and out of the blue he said, would you like me to tell you your vocation? Now he had never laid eyes on me. He didn't know anything about me and I had never done anything in the church. Would you like me to tell you your vocation? Yes, Father, sure. I thought he was going to say, you know, he was there recruiting at the seminary. Well, I think you're called to come with me, to come to my congregation, etc., etc. Uh-uh. He closed his eyes, and he said, your gift, your charism, is apostolic preaching and you will go to war. You will preach, and you will use the means of social communication. You will use television. You will use radio. You will use books. The internet hadn't been invented yet, or he would have said that. He didn't say you'll use the internet, but we've used all those things. I would have been a preacher were I born a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, that's God's plan, and I would have gone around doing missions like I did in the beginning, speaking to at first a couple hundred people here and a couple hundred people there, and then a thousand people here and maybe two thousand people or five thousand people, or like we did in Boston last a couple years ago, ten thousand people. But no. 
Frequently now when I speak, it's to millions. Millions. And it is just as easy for me to speak to 100 million people as it is for me to speak to 10 people through the means of social communication, the media, on television, you know. For me to produce a TV show, and I produce all my own shows in, in my own studio now, I can do that with less effort than it takes to talk to a hundred people in Podunk. I can reach millions all over the world. The truth goes out and war is waged. The enemy knows how to use this. The first ones to effectively use the internet were the pornography guys. Now, in case you don't know it, and I know you do know it, but that's one of the devil's major weapons. Now, I tell people this every place I go because nobody knows it unless they hear it from me. You know what pornography means. Do you know what the word pornography means? Well, I'm going to tell you because it's very instructive. Words are very instructive. The etymological derivation of words, the root of words. The word pornography comes from two Greek words. Pornoroi, graphia, pornography. Pornoroi, the devil. Graphia, pictures. Literal translation, pornography, the devil's pictures. Need I say more? That's what it is. More people are addicted today to pornography than are to heroin, cocaine, and all the other drugs put together. And it's just as destructive. It destroys families. It eats away the very fabric of our human dignity. Oh, it's one of the devil's favorite weapons. And he's very efficient at using that weapon. And there are people in this room today who are addicted to it. That's part of the battle. That's part of the war. And this war, this spiritual warfare, is won or lost one person at a time. If you are addicted to anything, you've got to break free. And you can't usually do it alone. You have to do it with help. Prayer, the sacraments, especially confession. That's the first step. Go to confession. If you have that addiction, and that's what it is. I, I, I did a very popular sermon called Addiction. We have that tape with, oh, it's very popular. A lot of people buy that. Addiction. You can be addicted to a lot of things. You, if you're addicted, you're a slave. You know, don't, don't, don't fool around. Don't, don't, don't deceive yourself. If you're addicted to anything, you're a slave. And God doesn't want you to be a slave. God wants you to be free. Jesus came to set the captives free. It is for freedom that you were born, not slavery. Some people are addicted to drugs. That's horrible. Oh, it's terribly destructive. Alcohol. Ah. The founder of my congregation, Father James Flanagan, is um, an Irish guy, actually, you know, obviously, from Boston. Big Irish family, nine children. His dad was a lawyer. Lined up the family every morning and marched to church. All of them, like a baseball team, nine of them. Mom, dad, all the kids. Father Jim was an All-American end on the Nash Championship Notre Dame football team. He, he was one of the first Navy SEALs. They weren't called SEALs in, back in World War II. UDT, underwater demolition teams. That training he got in the family from his parents. 
made him a great man. I, he told me a story once his dad died when he was young. And he said to his mom, mother, what was dad really like? And, and his mother with tears in her eyes said, Jimmy, if you're ever half the man your father was, you will be a great man. That's what she thought of her husband. Father never forgot that, and he went on to excel at everything he ever did, and he founded the Society of Our Lady, and he's been responsible for the ordination of hundreds of priests that have come through our order, and many religious sisters have come, and thousands of lay people, and he's a warrior. You look at him, you know, oh, he, he went on many combat missions during World War II. He was at Normandy. Matter of fact, he was one of the hundred men who went in first. One hundred hand-picked Navy SEALs, UDT guys, went in to take out the mines on the beaches at Normandy. Ninety-five of the hundred were killed outright by the mines and by the machine gun fire from the cliffs. He was one of five who lived. He walked straight through it, a mile inland, and sat on a rock and waited for the invasion force. And he never talks about it, but on 9-11, he was with me to bury my dad. And we watched those events on television on the West Coast, 5.30 in the morning it was. We watched live. We saw the second plane hit live on television, and we buried my father. I remember going to the funeral that morning after watching that. Now imagine that. You get up early in the morning, and um, my goddaughter Tamara called me. She said, turn the television on quick. There's something horrible is happening. We're under attack. Turn it on. You remember, how could we, none of us will ever forget. And we watched it, Father Jim and I together. And he just shook his head. He couldn't believe it. He said, we went to war against Hitler. And we were convinced that if, if we could just defeat that evil, then the world would be better. And, they, and he was right, the world was better. Evil has to be opposed, first of all, spiritually. Because if we don't win the war that is unseen, we cannot win the war that is seen. If we do not do battle with evil that is unseen, it is an exercise in futility to do battle with that which we can see. We went to bury my father. Now, my dad had been in the Navy during World War II. He was a CB in the South Pacific. Uh, my dad was a tough man, old school guy, um, very excellent athlete, not a great father when I was young, I have to say. He knew it, but a decent man. And in later years, he was a, a very good father. But I walked into the chapel where the funeral would be. And when I walked in, I saw something that really struck me. Now, remember where I had just come from. I had just come from a hotel room where I had seen the events of 9-11 live on television. And then I walked into this chapel, and there my father's casket was. And on my father's casket were two symbols an American flag, and a crucifix. The American flag, because he had defended his country, America, in a war. The crucifix, the symbol of another country, and another war. And that's what just leaped out at me. Right away, I, I, I recognized that my dad had fought for two countries in two wars. His country here on Earth, the United States, World War II, 
And then later on, he fought in a very different war, spiritual combat, for his heavenly homeland, spiritual warfare, very real. And you might as well be well-schooled in it now so you can deal with it now as well as later. The most powerful force in this spiritual warfare is what I told you about in the last hour. Penance and suffering, redemptive suffering, suffering united to Jesus on the cross. You know, when I preach, when I go around all the different places I've been, and I've been, I've preached in 49 states, Hawaii is the only one I haven't preached in, I preached in over 120 dioceses, many foreign countries, every province in Canada except Newfoundland. Um, I've flown almost 2 million miles by air in the last 11, 12 years. And often, wherever I go, in the front row, the people in the wheelchairs, hearing impaired, don't have their sight, some of them. Various infirmities, difficulties. And every single time, when I look at them, I marvel at the paradox of reality. Now, the world would look at them, especially the contemporary world, and say, mm, poor things. You know, they can't see. They can't hear. They, they can't walk, they can't do this, they can't do that. And the, the world, in its stupidity, doesn't recognize spiritual reality. They may say, oh well, their quality of life, their this, their that, is not any good. It's kind of, you, you, you can sum it up in what they did to Terry Schiavo. You know. That's what the world thinks, because the world is stupid. And they look at her and say, oh, well, her life is not worth anything. She can't talk. She can't walk. She, she can't do hardly anything. What could that life be worth? To be placed on the cross in Christ is to be set at the pinnacle of human possibilities. Why? You're in the power position. You are in a position to bring down grace on humanity unlike anyone else. Sometimes when you're blind, you can see things that no one else can see. You're physically blind. Very often your spiritual vision is made acute. Sometimes if you don't have your hearing, you're deaf to the noise of the world. You have ears for truth, and you can hear God in the silence. And what is that worth? And sometimes you can't walk. You're physically immobilized. And yet, you can fly on the wings of the Holy Spirit. You can go to the far ends of the heavens at the speed of a prayer. You can do great things. It is when I am weak that I am strong, St. Paul said. And it is in weakness that God's mighty power is brought to for per perfection. In this spiritual warfare, the mighty warriors, the strongest ones, are the weakest ones. Why? Because the greatest power that was ever unleashed on the face of the earth was the power of sacrifice, the power of the cross, that is what broke the devil's back. That is what broke the stranglehold of evil 
on humanity. Until that happened, the gates of heaven were closed. You, you know that. From the original sin until Jesus entered into his passion and death and resurrection, no one could go to heaven. Imagine that. Can you imagine living your life and you couldn't get into heaven? Can you imagine the, the, the hopelessness? They, they, they went to a holding tank, if I can call it that, Sheol, the abode of the dead. Now, the, the, the evil people, the people that didn't die in grace, you know, hell. But there were good people who did die in the state of grace, but they couldn't go to heaven. Where did they go? Well, this, this abode of the dead, this holding place. They, they couldn't see God. They didn't have that unbounded joy of, of being in the immediate presence of God, but they weren't damned. But they waited, and they waited. And then Jesus came. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it, Galatians 4.4. 4. Then Jesus took that human nature to the cross. And that was the definitive battle in the war. That's what gave us ammunition to win. That's what gave us power to fight the good fight, run the race to the finish line. I don't know how many years I have left on the face of the earth. Maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe 10, maybe a day, maybe an hour. I don't know. But I know the clock is ticking. That much I know. And I know that souls fall into hell like snowflakes. Because no one is praying and doing penance for them. How do I know that? Our Lady said it. Well, uh, how, how do we know she said it? She said it at Fatima, and it's approved by the church. God's children. God's children. That he loves with an infinite fatherly Love. Do you know, I, I'm going to tell you, you know how to really, if I can use human language, which is not really accurate when you're speaking of God, but it's analogous and, and you get the point. If you can contribute to saving one of the father's children, do you have any idea the joy that you could give? To God. Well, God doesn't need joy, you say. He's perfect. He has everything. He doesn't need anything. Yes, in one sense, that's true. But God, through his humanity, Jesus is God, through his human nature, experiences much of what we experience, suffering, joy. My mission and yours is to enter into this redemptive work of Christ, to fight this battle, to wage war against the devil, against evil. I love every human being, because every human being is a child of God, and God loves them. And if God loves them, who am I not to love them? Every sinner, every terrible sinner, God loves them. Yeah, but what about the murderer? God loves them. What about the rapist? God loves them. What about the terrorist as an individual human being? Yeah, God loves them. He doesn't love what they're doing. You know, it's summed up in a simple statement, and... and we all should remember it. And you know it. You've heard it. Love the sinner. Hate the sin. Love the sinner. 
when I was dead in sin, God loved me. But he didn't love the sin. You might be loved, brother or sister, and God forbid you should contract cancer uh, or AIDS or some other terrible disease. I would not stop loving you. If I had the heart of Jesus, I would love you even more. I, I, would, I would sacrifice somehow. If I could save you, if I can deliver you from cancer, what wouldn't I do to rescue you? That's the mind and heart of Jesus, right? Well, if you have the cancer of sin, I can't stop loving you. Love the sinner. But I hate the sin. A lot of times people get confused on that. That's why I, I've been accused by some who don't understand, oh, you have no love. Yeah, I do. You have no mercy. Oh, oh, I know all about mercy. You're not pastoral. Oh, indeed, I am pastoral. I love the sinner. No, you don't love sinners. Yes, I do. I love the sinner. I hate the sin. Oh, you can't hate. It's not right to hate. Well, use a different word if you like. But I'll use that when I hate the sin. Why? I know what it does. You see, I've been there and done that. I'm a double agent. I've been over on the enemy side. Oh, yes, I have been to most of the dark places on the earth. Oh, I've been there. I've seen Satan face to face in combat where he vanquished me for years, but not permanently. God is stronger. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. I would never believe some of the things that I've seen now as a priest. As a matter of fact, had I known 20 years ago what I would be getting into as a priest, sad to say I don't know if I'd have the courage to go through with it. But like Grandma used to say, isn't God smart? <laughs> Grandma, she'd smile sweetly and say, oh, isn't God smart? He sure is. You know, he knows how to hide stuff from us, you know. He knows we might turn tail and run, so he doesn't tell us everything all at once in advance. You know, he springs, springs us on, on, on us later. That's like maybe getting married, you know. Who oh, until death do us part on the wedding day. Yeah. Then 20 years later, ah, what have I done? And priests, too. Oh, on the ordination day. Oh, my ordination was at the Vatican. I was ordained at St. Peter's Basilica by Pope John Paul II. And when it was over, there, there were 62 of us there. And, <laughs> oh, it was, it was beyond words. 10,000 people were there. Uh, three choirs singing beautifully. You know, I had a saint in front of me and a saint behind me. In front of me was Pope John Paul II. Twenty feet behind me was Mother Teresa of Calcutta. When I got to my place during Mass, where the, the, the men to be ordained were lined up, I, 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 you know, walking in very solemnly in the procession, and then I look, I almost fell on the floor. There's Mother right behind me. Two of her men were being ordained that day with us. And so I had a saint behind me and a saint in front of me. And I remember thinking, I'm in a good spot. <laughs> but I hadn't always been in a good spot. For most of my life, I was useless. Useless in this spiritual combat. If, you know, it, I, I've often preached on this subject, but it came to me one day when I was praying and meditating 
preparing uh, to give a sermon on spiritual warfare. Um, I remember something my, uh, one of my drill instructors in the Army said when I was a kid. You know, I, 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 eight, I was 18 years old uh, in basic training, I think. And, you know, one of the things they do when you go in, into the Army or the Marines or whatever, um, they have to condition you physically, right? You have physical training, PT, physical training. And so they run you ragged. Now, I was kind of accustomed to being run ragged because I had had a legendary football coach in high school, and that man was a winner. He, he would take, we were a small town, class B school, and we regularly beat AAA schools in football. Why the coach? Legendary man. And how did he do it? He brutally trained us, and I do mean brutally. He had no mercy, none. He ran us beyond our endurance. So I was used to running until I dropped. I, I, I knew what it meant to be tired and to have to go on. And then, but then it, I got new meaning in, in, in the Army, physical training. And one day the sergeant said to us, um, you know, Smokey the Bear, you know, you know the, the training guys, the, the, drill, the DIs, drill instructors with the campaign hats, the Smokey the Bear hats. We used to call them Smokey. Uh-oh, here comes Smokey. One day, Smokey said to us, you ladies, you ladies can't fight a war. If you can't even get to the battlefield, meaning we're in lousy physical condition, if you can't even get to the battlefield, how are you going to fight? You won't even make it to the battlefield. And then he used some language that I can't use. And, and, he, and, he, and he told us how, how sad and sorry a lot we were because, hey, you couldn't run. Oh, you, you run 10 miles and you, you, and you think you've done something. And so, oh, they ran us and ran us and ran us and ran us. If you're not in good enough condition to do a, far, uh, a forced march for 30 miles through a swamp and then up a mountain for three or four days, how are you going to get to the battlefield that, where you have to fight? If you're not even in a state of grace, huh, what good are you in the spiritual combat? You see, if you can't even get on the battlefield, and I wasn't on the battlefield most of my life. I couldn't do it. I, w I was living a terrible life, living in sin, useless. But mom was home praying. You know, praying the rosary. Grandma was home praying, praying the rosary. All my, my good uh, relatives, my Aunt Philomena and my Aunt Mary and my Uncle Jimmy and my Uncle Tony, they all prayed. They knew what was going on with me. They never gave up, by the way. You know, people often, Italian people will come and say, what part of Italy are your people from, Father? Calabria. And they smile and say, oh, Calabria, testa dura. <laughs> right? You know, a hard head. My family's pet name for me was Chooch. I, I can say stuff like that in an area like Buffalo, because I know there's going to be a, a good number of Italians, and they know, they know the line. Chooch means jackass. That's what, why, why they call me Jack? Stubborn, hard-headed, stubborn. Now that can be good. St. Augustine used to say, grace builds on nature. You know, uh, stubbornness is not a good thing, but it can be turned into tenaciousness, you know, where you're not going to give up. You know, fine, tell me I can't do that again. <laughs> you know, keep telling me I can't do it and watch me do it. You know, or keep telling me, oh, uh, you, you have delusions of grandeur. You'll never be on television. Okay. And, and so, you know, the Italian nun gets me on television. Right? <laughs> you know, and how, how much did they tell her she couldn't do anything? You know, well, what's she going to do? A little woman, no formal education. She's crippled. No one in modern times anywhere in the church has done anything near what the crippled little woman did. 
Why? You know, and I'm, I'm not, I, I, my shows are on EWTN, and, but, you know, I'm not like a member of EWTN or I got no, no stock in EWTN or anything like that. But, uh, but I'll tell you, with no fear, and, uh, you know, want, you want, if you ever want to start a fight in a rectory, mention her name. <laughs> Some places, not everywhere, but a lot of places. You know, secondarily mine, not so much. I mean, they don't know who I am quite often, but they know who she is. Mighty warrior in this spiritual warfare. And how does Mother pray? You know, how does Mother Teresa pray? How does Mother Angelica pray? The way I've been telling you for the last two days. Simple. The only thing you see her do anymore is pray the rosary, right? On television, that's about the only thing. To, and she's doing it every day. You can do it too. Pray the rosary. Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Um, if you get in a tight spot, do what I told you, the emergency novena. Right? You remember that? The emergency of Mother Teresa's emergency novena? Nine memoraries. That's what Mother Teresa taught me. If you ever get in a spot, Father, where you have an emergency, uh, you know, make a novena. I said, a novena? I got to go nine days before, you know, I might be hanging off a cliff. She said, right, that's what I'm talking about. You know, I've been hanging off cliffs for 60 years. Nine memoraries. That's my emergency novena, Mother Teresa told me. You can do that. The Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Over and over. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust. And if it gets real bad, which I've had it real, real, so bad I couldn't think, so, so bad I was so scared, I was terrified, traumatized, all I could say was, Jesus, Jesus. And in that holy name of Jesus is everything. It's a powerful prayer when you just... Speak that holy name of Jesus. You know what the name Jesus means. God saves. You know, I told you the meaning of words is important. It's very instructive. That's God's name. Is Jesus God? Yes. What does the word Jesus mean? It means God saves. Think about that. You get in trouble if you're sick. Oh, a few years ago, they told me I was going to die from a heart condition. They said, you have to have emergency heart surgery tomorrow. I said, okay. Luckily, a lot of people went. They put it on EWTN incorrectly. They said, Father Crappie has had a heart attack. <laughs> and uh, so everybody prayed for me, you know. Everybody all over. And, and I think God arranged for the error, you know. So if they said, well, hey, Father has some heart problems, maybe nobody prayed. Father had a heart attack. Everybody prayed. So as it turned out, I didn't end up going to that hospital where I was supposed to have surgery the next day. I went to, of all places, Las Vegas for the surgery, for the surgery. <laughs> yeah, not to play roulette, because <laughs> I have friends there. And I, the first thing I did, I went to confession. You know, I, I wasn't conscious of mortal sins or anything, but, eh, you know, you want to go to confession before you face something like that. The war was raging. I was kind of scared. I'll admit it to you. Hey, listen, when I'm up here, I'm King Kong. I'm not afraid of anything, you know. When I'm preaching, a charism is activated. No, not my doing. It's God's doing. All I do is show up for work. That's all I do. I don't do anything, believe me. I, I couldn't do it. People think, oh, Father, you do the, you're so good, you do this and that. <laughs> you should know. Uh, <laughs> no. I'm a big chicken. I, I lay awake at night sweating, scared of a million things. And yet, I get on the plane, I show up for work. God does the rest. He really does. I'm not saying that trying to be humble or something. That's the truth. All I do is show up for work. I didn't really know. I had the topics that I was going to talk about. I didn't really know what I was going to say. 
Show up for work, open your mouth. You know, show up for work, begin, and God, you know, God will help you out. But I was scared that, that night before I was supposed to go in, and, and, and I, I really couldn't pray the rosary even. That's a simple prayer. That's easy prayer. But I needed something easier. And so maybe the divine mercy job. Now i got, I got to have something easier than that. How about the memorari? That's pretty easy. That, yeah, i got to have something easier than that. I it kept, kept going simpler and simpler, easier. And finally, the holy name of Jesus. That's all. Jesus. 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 God willing, I, I, that's how I'll die. With the holy name of Jesus on my lips. Power. No matter what you go through in life, no matter what trial or trauma, you can get through it. See, the devil is trying to destroy you. And I'm not saying that in, a, um, in an analogical sense or, or just as a manner of speaking. I mean it literally. Literally. He is the enemy, and he's got millions of fallen angels to help him. But, of course, we have good angels to help us, and all the saints, and Our Lady. And so we have a coalition. You know, you heard that I, President Bush used that term, build a coalition. I, don't, I never heard of it before until he used that term. Yeah, we have the original coalition, you know, the church, the angels, all the saints. We do. They love us. They're our brothers and sisters. Uh, have devotion to them, pray to them, ask them for help. I do, all the time. I've been in places in, in, in my priesthood. Oh, when we went, remember in 2002 during Lent when, it, when the scandals broke, when it was so horrible, remember you couldn't get away from that. On television every day, in the newspapers every day. And it was a terrible thing, and some of our brother priests were guilty. They were. Terrible. Uh, but don't be scandalized by that, by the way. It is a scandal, to be sure. But don't be scandalized by it. Why not? You know, some bishops asked me not too long ago, they said, we, we, Father, we don't ever want this to happen again. And what, we, what is your advice? Uh, how can we absolutely, positively make sure that something like this never happens again? And I didn't have to think about it. I said very quickly, well, Bishop, never or, again ordain a human. And I'm not kidding. Oh, we can do things, and we should. Provide for their training, make sure they have the right uh, psychological um, basis for the, to be a good priest, make sure that they, they don't have certain kinds of orientations that are apt to get them into trouble, you know, give them good formation, the sacraments, prayer, and so forth. Yes, we can do things in the natural order and, and the, even the spiritual to help. But don't think that you will ever totally eliminate it, you won't. Why? The human condition. You think priests lose their humanity when they get ordained? No, we're still human. Do we get graces uh, to, to perform our ministry and, and to resist it? Sure, sure, God gives you the tools to get the job done, no question about it. But they're human, and the devil is working a hundred, a thousand times harder to bring down a priest than anything. Why? Logical. Strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. That's the spiritual warfare. Now, you're involved in this. And sure, he'd like to bring you down, too. Like to bring down a religious, like to bring down a mom, a dad, a lay person. Sure, you're a target. You really are. You've got to fight, too. How do you fight? How do you fight this, this combat, this spiritual warfare? The way I've been telling you. Do it in a simple way, not rocket science. Pray the rosary. Chaplet of divine mercy. Use the holy name of Jesus. Those little invocations. Praise be, praise be Jesus Christ. Hail Mary. Little things. Virtue. Practice virtue. Little things with great love. All of this makes for a good soldier. Okay? And know the nature of the enemy. Know how brutal he is, how unscrupulous he is. Oh, and he's clever. He's clever. You know, he'll come at you one way, and if he can't get you that way, oh, he'll bide his time, and he'll come back another way. You know, when, when a lot of us are young, he gets us through sins against purity. 
Oh, that's a big one. That's a, that's, that's a major weapon. Uh, he'll get us, you know. Um, it's, it's fallen human nature. But later on, maybe you, you mature, you take your faith more seriously, you receive the sacraments, you pray, and you're not immune from anything. <clears throat> one, one day, a, a lady came up to me, she was in her 80s, and she said, Father, I have a, a, a terrible problem. <clears throat> and usually when those sweet old ladies come up to me, they go to confession, and the worst sin they have is that they yelled at their cow. <laughs> or something like that. You know, it's not, usually not a big deal. And she said, Father, I have terrible struggles with chastity and I'm 85. <laughs> and I, I said, uh, well, oh, I'm not surprised. So I to oh, told her a story that I always tell from, from the annals of the Desert Fathers. Uh, a young novice went to one of the old holy monks in the desert, and he said, Father, you're renowned for your holiness. Everybody knows you're a saint. He said, but I'm just a novice. I'm young, and, and I have terrible temptations against chastity. And what I need to know from you is at what age do these things go away? And the old man looked at him in horror and he said, I don't know, my son, but from what they tell me, three days after you're in the grave. <laughs> well, as you get older, it does get better, thank God, you know. The, not as bad. Thank God we're not 16 anymore, or, you know, something like that. So it, it does improve. But if he doesn't come at you that way, he'll come at you in another way. You know, uh, my big one, I have to struggle sometimes with bitterness. I get angry at, at certain things that I consider. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, and, and I don't mean to criticize uh, uh, the bishops or anything like that. I, I feel sorry for them. They have the hardest job in the world. I sympathize with them. Uh, but, you know, some of the things... Like with the scandals, it drove me nuts. And now a, a commission of uh, psychiatrists and sociologists, uh, experts on the subject, met in Rome, and they told the Vatican the zero tolerance policy is nonsense. You can't do that. The only thing that, that works is on a case-by-case -case basis. You look at each case. I can tell you, case, you know, they, they try to equate you know, one of them in Boston who was a terrible, he did terrible things, a criminal, you know, he was a predator, and he preyed on, on children. That's horrible. That's out, outrageous. That's one thing. I know of another case of a very famous priest who was, he had a problem when he was 25 years old, newly ordained. He was a chaplain of a girls' college. You know, when, you, when you're young, sometimes... Hormones have more to do with your life than brains, you know. And, and, and he, he, like many of us, he had a temporary problem. He, he had a fling with a 17-year-old co-ed co 35 years ago. He felt horrible. It didn't last. It was a week maybe, you know, one time I think. He, so he goes to confession and he goes to his bishop and he, and like a son to his father, said, I did a terrible thing. And he tells them what happened, and okay. 35 years later, when all the mess took place, a diocese not far from here, I won't mention it, the, the, one lawyer is, handles all the cases, all the abuse cases. And so he gets a subpoena, and he gets every file of every case of this kind of, a, of an allegation for 100 years. Gets them all. And they find this case, they find this file. 35 years ago, this priest had this affair, whatever you want to call it, you know, a week. He, he immediately repented. He immediately went to confession. He immediately told his bishop. And he never did it again, ever, for 35 years. Threw him out in the street like a dirty rag. I don't know where the mercy is. Now, by the way, the girl didn't complain. They had never heard from her. There was no complaint. No complaint. It was in the file. It never would have been unless he was honest, and he was honest 35 years ago. Came back to haunt him. No. Threw him out. Can't call him father. 
can't hear confessions, he can celebrate Mass privately, alone in his home. That's all. They won't even let him go to a Catholic retreat house as a retreatant. Treat him like a leper. I don't know where mercy is in any of that. I don't understand it, except in the context of war, the spiritual combat. And so we have to pray for our priests, and the priests have to pray for you. I wasn't ordained for me. I was ordained for you. But I know this. Without you, I couldn't survive another day. A lot of people pray for me. Because every place I go, and every place I've ever gone, I always ask the people, I beg them, please. Please pray for me. Please. And I'm not saying that lightly, or like I don't really need it or something. I need it. I know who I am. I know where I've been. I'm weak. I'm nothing. I'm human. I'm a speck of dust. I need a lot of prayers. Pray for me. I'll pray for you. We'll fight the good fight together. I've tried to teach you. I've tried to inspire you all these years. I've tried to be faithful to the truth, to the church. You have to. You work at it, I'll work at it. We'll fight the good fight, and it is a fight. And I exhort you, do not give up, and do not take your ease as though there is no battle in progress. There is a battle, fierce, more fierce than any battle you've ever seen on the face of the earth. One time, the great Saint Anthony of the desert was praying in the desert and he saw a vision of the combat between the good angels and the bad with man caught in the middle. And it was so violent, so horrible, he cried out to God, take this away from me and never show me this again. It's too frightening. And that was a man accustomed to being attacked by the devil and fighting spiritual warfare. So horrible was it. I remember when I was in Los Angeles living a bad life. I had a friend who was a detective in the police department and every once in a while I'd ride with him in the car riding around uh, on a Friday or Saturday night, and he got a call to go to a place that was behind a nightclub. And we went there, and there was a girl, 14-year-old girl, dead in a dumpster. And I didn't think in a spiritual way back then. But years later, I, I can see that as clear today as I did at that time. And, and, and I can't help but thinking that's where God, that's where the devil wants your children and your grandchildren dead in a garbage can. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. What do you want? Oh, I want them to be saved. Me too. Me too. <laughs> and so what are you going to do about it, though? What are you going to do about it? Souls fall into hell like snowflakes. Combat rages on all sides. And what are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Pray. Pray. Live virtuously. Fight evil. Live a pure life. Exercise humility. Exercise simplicity. Pray the rosary. Do all these little things. It's easy. That's not hard. You can do it. I can do that. We might be incapable of other things, but easy things, we can do it. And that's all you got to do. Easy things. Easy prayer. For hard times. I remember my dad, I told you he was a tough guy. You know, uh, he was kind of, he, he was one of those wild Italian kids. He was a very excellent athlete. A uh, very handsome man. 
uh, he, he, uh, he was a, like a lot of guys of, of his ilk. Um, he drank too much, he gambled. I uh, used to go to Saratoga all the time, and he was an inveterate gambler. Used to, you know, casino games, uh, chased women. Oh, I remember growing up as a kid, it was awful. Women would call the house, you know, my mother would be, oh, it was terrible. So he, he wasn't a good dad or a good husband when he was young. Uh, he got older, he got wiser. He was sad. I remember when I got ordained. My Aunt Louise called up one day and she said, you know, you and, you, you're, you and your old man ought to be reconciled. I hadn't seen him in 20 years. He left us when I was 12. And I said, I'm all for it. Absolutely. She said, good, I'll set it up. Have lunch with him or something. So I did. And during the course, it was cordial, it was nice. He was a, a very, by then he was humble. He was a humble man. In his day, he was hell on wheels. Oh! One day in a, in a restaurant in Las Vegas, and he wasn't young then, there was a great big guy in the restaurant, loud, drunk, smoking a cigar. And, I, and, I, and my old man was getting more and more agitated. And I remember thinking to myself, no, Lord, please, no, no, no. And I could ensure, oh, he got up, and I couldn't stop him in time. He went over, and he grabbed the cigar out of this big guy's mouth, and he put it out in his wine glass. And he said, now shut up. <laughs> and, oh, he was a, he was a rough guy. He, he was, you know, a street guy, actually. But as he got older, the ravages of illness, heart condition, arthritis, bad back, bad eyes, bad hands. He had over 30 surgeries. Well, that day we had lunch, and he's, he said to me with all sincerity, he said, I wish, I wish I could have been a better father. And I can tell you God our Father heard that as a prayer. And from that moment, my dad entered into that spiritual combat that I alluded to when I said I saw the crucifix on his casket and you know he'd fought in two wars. He entered into spiritual warfare. He had over 30 surgeries between that day when he said I wish I could have been a better father and the day he died which was September 8th 2001. You know what September 8th is? The Blessed Mother's birthday. He had been praying the rosary for the last seven years of his life, receiving the Eucharist, the priest would bring it, offering up his son. He didn't know. I, I gave him my doctoral thesis. I said, Dad, here's my doctoral thesis. You can have a copy. I signed it for him. A few months later, I said, you read, you read the thesis, Dad? He said, oh, yeah. And I said, you understand it? He said, oh, no. He said, but I understand it has to do with the cross and, and, and that offering up, you know, your sufferings and stuff. I, I, under, I got that. I said, oh, you got it then. You got it. Never said another word about it. He spent the last several years of his life in great pain. He had so much pain in his back that he couldn't lie down. He, his lungs were in such bad shape, he had to sit up to sleep in a chair. Multiple times I'd be preaching and I'd get a phone call, your father's dying, and I'd have to run off to the hospital or wherever. Well, what was he doing? He was engaged in combat. He was praying. He was suffering. By the way, it's what my mother's doing right now as we speak, and she has been for years, suffering. And you know, I'm helpless to do anything about it. Oh, I talk to her on the telephone every day horrible depression. Medication doesn't help. Sometimes makes it worse. What's happening? Combat. She's at war. She's not aware of it completely. She knows about offer it up, though. She knows that, just like Dad did. They're fighting the good fight right to the last moment. And, and that's a consoling thing to know. You and I, our lives are valuable right to the very last moment. Why? Because we're in Jesus. 
were lifted up on his cross, united with him. You know, Dad would have a heart surgery and he'd be on the verge of death. I'd rush to the ICU in Los Angeles. Well, I remember one time I had preached in Buffalo. And I went home and I had to uh, fly to Los Angeles, rent a car, drive to downtown Los Angeles to St. Vincent's Hospital. I walked in the, in the ICU. Now, my dad had been, a, I told you, a great athlete, 200 pounds, not very tall, powerful man, though, uh, excellent athlete, and, and oh boy, he, I told you, he was a rough guy. He was my boxing coach in the early years for, for the Golden Gloves. And um, I saw him, I walked in, I'll never forget the picture. There was my big, strong dad. He weighed about 80 pounds in a diaper. We couldn't move, he was unconscious. And I looked at him for a long time. If you don't have faith, awful hard to take that kind of a picture. But I knew that Our Lady had him. God had him in the palm of his hand. And so he came out of it, and oh, so many times, seven, eight times, I used to rush off and give him anointing of the sick. He'd be in a coma, ready to die. Give him anointing of the sick. And he'd come out of it. Oh, the last time they said, this time for sure, he's only got about a day left. Okay, all right. Get in the airplane. Rush over there. He was home by now, not in the hospital. He's home. Russian anointing of the sick. Oh, through this holy anointing. May the Lord grant you, etc., etc. Sat bolt up, upright out of a coma. Blinked his eyes and said, Padre. What are you doing here? I mean, he's on the verge of death, you know? And he said, I'm hungry. So we went out in the kitchen. He was in a wheelchair. And we had a salami sandwich. <laughs> and some of you heard me tell this before, but it fits into this context of prayer and spiritual warfare. Now, my dad, when he was a young man, a teenager, really, in World War II, I'm sure that he did his job in the Navy. He, he, was, he was blasted out of a Jeep one time on one of the beaches in the South Pacific, and he, and he carried a, a metal steel plate in his skull uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, he, he took great delight in walking through airports, <laughs> set off the security devices, and they'd search him. Nothing, you know. And he said, ah, it's in my head. <laughs> what do you mean it's in your head? And he'd knock on his head, you know, <laughs> steel plate in his head. Ah, when he was young, he was strong. When he was old, he was weak. He fought for the United States in World War II, and at the end of his life, he fought for heaven in this spiritual combat. And he was even stronger. Oh, it was hard to look at him. I'm sure it was hard for people to look at Terry Schiavo, too. Remember, when she was dying, and she wasn't dying, by the way. Let me correct myself. She wasn't dying. They killed her. She wasn't sick, and she wasn't dying. But when she was going through that, when all that controversy was going on, on the other side of the ocean, Pope John Paul II was dying. And he, he, he couldn't move. He was in bed. Should they have killed him too? Well, to use their logic. And so my dad was weak and helpless, and, but he was strong. Like St. Paul said, it's when I am weak that I am strong. And he fought that combat. I remember looking at him at the end after that, that last visit. We ate a little bit, went in the living room and picked him up out of the wheelchair and put him in the sofa. And I remember how small he looked. I also remember how little John Paul II looked when I stood next to his casket in Rome. 
You know, he's such an imposing man. He's a powerful man, too, in his day, in many ways, even physically. He was a good athlete, John Paul I, in his day. My dad looked so little in the corner of the sofa. You know how when you're a little kid, you know, you put the baby in the corner of the sofa, how little they are, they kind of disappear into it, you know. And then when we're old, we're like a little child again. And we talked a little bit, and I had to catch a plane. I said, Dad, I have to go now. He said, I know. I know. He said, now you take care of yourself. And I said, well, you do, Dad. I knew I'd never see him alive again. And he looked at me. He said, don't ever quit. He used to say that to me when I was a kid boxing in the Golden Gloves. When, especially when I was in one with somebody better than me, stronger, faster, better fighter. And don't you quit. I was afraid to quit. I never quit. I lost once or twice, but I never quit. Why? I was afraid of my own man. <laughs> if I quit in the ring, he'd have killed me. Don't you ever quit. He was, he knew, I think the Holy Spirit was speaking through him. He was talking about the priesthood talking about the fight I was in now, this spiritual combat. Don't you ever quit. No, sir. No, sir, I won't. And he kind of smiled faintly. He said, I'll be seeing you. And I said, yeah, Dad. You know, when I looked in his eyes that last time, he was so little, weak. I didn't see the eyes of a defeated man or a scared man, or a weak man, I saw pure power. I saw strength and courage. And that came from faith. And that came from prayer. My dad was a simple man. All he knew how to do was easy prayer. And now he had hard times. Easy prayer for hard times. It got him through. It got him through. And at the end, he went in peace. Strong in his weakness. Courageous in the heat of battle. And I'm sure, oh yes, he'd had a rough life. He had his share of sin in his life. But I'm sure that those last years were pleasing to God. And I have no doubt that God embraced him on the other side. And he will you too. He will you too. Fight the good fight. Pray these easy prayers. Easy prayer. For hard times, no matter what comes, you can handle it. No matter what adversity you face, you will triumph over it. Jesus has gone first. Jesus has entered the darkness. Jesus has entered the pain. Jesus has entered death itself and emerged victorious. And through him, with him, and in him, so too will you. So too will you. And on the other side, you'll get the crown of victory. Wage war while you're here against evil through prayer. And if I never see you again, and I know some of you, I'll never see you again on this side. But on the other side, I hope to see you all. We'll be reunited, God's family. And although I haven't gotten a chance to know you, most of you, I don't know your name, but we'll have eternity, all eternity, catch up on things. And so, I wish you Godspeed, and I wish you good battles. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And one day soon, we'll meet on the other side and have a long, long eternity to be together. God love you. God bless you, and goodbye.